Welcome to another EDUMED video and in this video we'll be updating the latest ICNARC audit data as published on the 17th of April. This will follow a very similar pattern to the previous videos to help compare the different audit reports as they came out. We'll focus a little bit on the demographics, interestingly the length of stay, the level of organ support that's required and survival of these patients. With every week that passes, we're getting more and more information and therefore it becomes better and easier to make longer term conclusions. But with all of this data, we're still in very early days. And so to take all of this with a pinch of salt, these are just my early interpretations of what the data is showing. There are many, many confounders. But one thing I really do want to emphasize is that the data that we're presenting here is the UK intensive care data. This does not include patients who have come into hospital but never come to intensive care, nor does it include any of the data of patients in the community. And the vast majority of patients with COVID-19 do not come to intensive care. It's only a small percentage that actually make, it, make their way to intensive care, and that's the population that I'll be talking about in the ICNARC audit data set. So... In terms of the participation, we're getting more and more units coming online and um, there are new units that are participating and there are also new units that are starting to give more information. Um, some of this will be related to the um, new centres that are being opened up, such as, for example, the Nightingale Hospital in London. And that's why the number has just increased here. So this is the data from last week. And you can see here that the numbers of patient numbers of units with no patients with COVID are starting to go down. And as this virus starts to spread all over the country, I expect that to come further down. In terms of the numbers of critical care admissions, it has increased quite significantly from uh, the previous week, and now we're up to 6,664 critical care admissions. And we have data, fantastically, for 5,500 of these. Of these, there have been 1,500 deaths in intensive care. And I want to emphasise that we're talking about intensive care patients and not all patients. Obviously, the total death toll is much higher than that, um, because that includes people dying in the community, in nursing homes and in, on the hospital premises, but not making their way to intensive care due to ceilings of care and so on. You can see here that the numbers of patients who have died on intensive care are roughly the same as those patients who have survived. And so that 50-50 um, risk of death or surviving in when you come to intensive care pr still seems to hold true. Interestingly, the number of patients that are remaining in intensive care is slowly going up, and that probably indicates that lag time, and I'll go through that in a lot of detail later in this talk, where we look at the length of stay and the fact that this is a condition that isn't going to have a quick turnaround like we initially hoped when this first came about and we talked about it being a uh, potentially single organ failure condition. We're now starting to see many more patients with complex ventilatory needs and complex multi-organ involvement. This graph basically shows the distribution of COVID patients around both the UK uh, not including Scotland. So that is England, Wales and Northern Ireland. You can see that the top three here are all London and London seems to be worst hit at the moment. Partly probably because it's got such a dense population. It's got quite a transient population with a lot of people coming from different countries and therefore the risk of spread of a pandemic would always be firstly in London then move to the rest of the country from there. What is interesting that we're starting to see a lot more people in the north of England starting to get and these, this is a spike that we're seeing 
in Birmingham and I suspect that all of these bars will start moving across as more and more of the country start to get exposed to COVID and it's once one person is infected they are likely to infect many others. In terms of the demographics, if you compare this to the previous um, week, it hasn't really changed much. We're still talking about a median and a mean age of around 60 for patients who are being admitted to intensive care. And the range, the interquartile range at least, seems to be fairly tight actually. It's between 52 and 68. Interestingly, although the mean and median are the same for um, the viral pneumonias that were non-COVID, and this is data from 2017 to 2019 compared to COVID, the range of ages in these viral pneumonias that were non-COVID, so before COVID came along, was actually much wider. That might be partly because we are starting to get more strict with regards to our assessment of eligibility to intensive care and having more open and honest conversations with patients and their family about the suitability of intensive care. Um, but certainly, this seems to be a tighter group of patients, the standard deviations 12.6 versus 17.4. The striking thing that we saw right from the start and was reported in China, in Italy, Spain, and we're seeing in this country as well, is the fact that this predominantly seems to affect men more than women in the intensive care population. And I emphasize that. What this is potentially suggesting is that men are getting more critically unwell than women and therefore that's assuming that you're getting equal spread of the disease between the two sexes or equal exposure between the two uh, sexes which is a relatively fair assumption to make but there are confounders as with all of this data they have not accounted for the fact that Maybe those men are in a demographic that are more likely to be exposed to um, the virus. And to just give an example, in uh, British transport, the vast majority of uh, bus drivers tend to be male. And therefore, if they're being more exposed to people and therefore to the virus, they're more likely to get a higher viral load and therefore potentially get more unwell. So we can't read too much into this. But certainly this trend that we're seeing of about 70% of intensive care patients with COVID being men seems to be carrying forward. And as the numbers grow, it seems to be sticking pretty static at that ratio. And I think that's probably quite reasonable. Comparing that to um, non-COVID viral pneumonias, which seem to have a more equal distribution between men and women. Thankfully, in terms of pregnancy, we're talking about very small numbers of women, but we aren't seeing a great predilection towards pregnant women developing severe COVID, requiring them to come into intensive care. Now, that statement has to be taken with a great deal of care, because don't forget that these patients who are pregnant are potentially self-isolating themselves, being more careful about exposure to the virus, and for all of those reasons, maybe reducing their risk, which is nothing to do inherently with being pregnant or not in terms of their physiology, but more in terms of psychology and the sociology of how they expose themselves. And also they may well have had greater protections. They were classed as being in a vulnerable um, group. And so employers were much more readily uh, giving pregnant women jobs that required them to stay at home as opposed to having to come in and remotely working. So although we are seeing that, we've got to take that with a pinch of salt. We don't know for certain that pregnancy confers a, um, a resistance to developing severe illness with COVID. Interestingly, there's been some studies where they've looked at the incidental um finding that a woman who's pregnant has COVID and it does seem to occur in a lot of pregnant women but they don't seem to show the symptoms. But again very early days we've got to get a lot more data before we know exactly how this is going to affect pregnant women. An area of real contention was this notion that 
ethnicity seemed to confer an increased risk, with both Asian and black patients being overrepresented in those with critically unwell um, COVID infections. And even if you compare this to the um, non-COVID viral pneumonias, where you're talking about 6% and um, 3%, you compare that to the 14.9% and the 11.2%, um, in COVID patients, there does seem to be this predilection. Now, again, one has to um, bear in mind there are multiple confounders to this. Firstly, we're seeing a lot of this disease in London, and London by its very nature has a much higher um, proportion of patients uh, or population that are of ethnic minorities and first-generation immigrants. Socioeconomically, they tend to be... Um, poorer and may well be doing jobs that are more public facing and therefore at increased risk of having a higher viral load exposure. So even though we're seeing this, I'm not sure whether that automatically confers to a genetic predisposition to them having severe disease or whether it's more of a socioeconomic one. But it's an interesting trend nonetheless. I'll be showing some graphs about body mass index, but interestingly, what seems to be happening with um, COVID-19 is that it seems to be affecting all the different BMIs um, roughly in proportion with their dis population distribution. Whereas the viral pneumonias, and again, it'll be clearer on the graph, tend to affect more um, the patients with a lower BMI. So let's look first of all at um, age and sex. The bars denote the patients with COVID and this is the percentage of the number of patients with them. The solid lines denote the viral non-COVID pneumonia. So this is from data from 2017 to 2019 before COVID-19 was around. And the first thing to note is that if you look at the males, which are the um, grey line or the grey bar, and females, which are the dark blue bar or the line, let's look first of all at the non-COVID disease. You can see that the lines are pretty similar up until sort of 40 years of age, where you start to get a little bit of divergence. But generally speaking, you can see here that the risk of um, being admitted to intensive care with a non-COVID viral pneumonia was about the same for men and women below the age of 40. And between 40 and 80, men were slightly higher risk of um, coming to intensive care, but almost in line with women. Now, obviously, I haven't got error bars in on this, um, and I haven't seen the raw data to be able to do that. But you can see that they're relatively close together throughout. You then compare that to the bars, which is the COVID disease, and you can see that almost at every single step, there are far more men being affected than women. Obviously, again, we don't have the error bars to be able to speak um, for certain. However, certainly what we can see is that it does seem to have a higher propensity for men than for women. Now, looking at the ethnicity, this is a really interesting graph because what they've put in orange here is the local population ethnicity as match matched on the 2011 census. And this is the viral pneumonias, which are non-COVID as the line, and the bars again are COVID. So you can see that there's a lot of um, white or Caucasian patients who are positive with COVID, more so than Asians and Blacks. But again, there's a higher proportion of um, people who are Caucasian who um, in the population. So if it equally affected all the different um, ethnicities, what you would expect is this bar to equal here, this orange bar. This bar to equal this one, this one to equal this one, and the other to equal that one. So you can see here that the orange line is much higher than the COVID line. 
So it tends to indicate it's as a proportion affecting less the Caucasian, the group, and slightly more the Asian, black, and other groups. So this does add some credence to the suggestion that um, it is affecting ethnic minorities a little bit more than Caucasians. Now, there are a number of problems with that analysis, and I think that's way too crude an analysis to actually draw meaningful conclusions. Firstly, we're looking at 2011 census data. The transient nature of the population in London mean that we may well have had a big shift in the number of um, ethnic minorities in London alone in that time. And so maybe this now reflects more the uh, population that's present in London. Also, we're talking about very small numbers here, and we have no error bars, so we don't know what the variance here is in the data. But there is this tendency towards ethnic minorities seeming to get more severe COVID infection. And then you have to um, ask yourself the question if that is the case. And certainly you compare that to the viral non-COVID, there is significantly, well, I say significantly, we don't have the statistics, but you can see there are more um, patients with COVID, the block, than with the viral pneumonia, which tends to suggest maybe there is some predilection, whether that's socioeconomic related or whether it's genetic predisposition, I have no idea, and I don't think we will have a good idea for a long time yet. Interestingly, with the BMI data, you can see here that it, with the age and sex match for the general population, the COVID data, the bars, seem to follow it fairly accurately. Um, whereas with the non-COVID disease, this line here, you can see that there seems to be a negative skew, tending to indicate that the lower BMIs are more uh, at risk of developing viral pneumonias that require critical care in the non-COVID group than with the COVID group. Again, small numbers, difficult to draw true um, conclusions yet, but this tendency has been fairly consistent throughout the last three ICNARC um, publications. Now, looking at um, the demographics of the patients in terms of their pre-morbid status, I think is really important. And here we're comparing the COVID data with non-COVID viral pneumonias. The thing that I really want to highlight in this is just how good the pre-morbid state of patients are in the COVID group. These are patients who are effectively fit and healthy, who are coming to intensive care. Now, although about just less than three quarters of patients were fit and healthy in the viral pneumonia groups, more than 90% of the COVID group are. Part of that is related to the fact that we're self-selecting the groups of patients that we're taking because we're doing clinical frailty index scores and um, just having a much better thought about what's appropriate to come to intensive care and what's not. But... These are well patients who are getting sick. And in terms of comorbidities, generally speaking, they're all very low. There aren't that many um, patients with other problems that are coming to intensive care. So before they develop COVID, they're generally a fit and healthy group of patients. What's also worth noting is the fact that the amount of time that they've spent in hospital prior to coming to intensive care is very short when we look at the COVID patients compared to the non-COVID patients. A standard deviation of 7 versus 13.4 for the mean. And roughly about two days for COVID, three days for the non-COVID viral pneumonias. Now again, there's a number of confounding factors when you look at this. Firstly, we as an intensive care group have been much more engaged in taking these patients at an earlier stage in their disease process to manage them, knowing how bad that they're going to potentially get with this disease. Secondly, and I think this does play a big part, is the concerted effort not to use um, 
basic ventilatory support such as CPAP or high flow nasal oxygen, which we know works really well in the viral pneumonia group. And actually, there's a lot of data from Italy, Spain, suggesting that it might be good. Obviously, it's not as easy as just deciding to use these basic ventilatory support mechanisms like CPAP or high flow nasal oxygen, because one needs to think about the risk to the staff, the potential for them to be aerosol generating procedures, and with the current lack of PPE that's around, we have to be very careful about what we do, both in terms of protecting our patients, but also protecting our staff. I added this last bit in about CPR because I think it's quite interesting. I think there's not much meaningful stuff that we can take out of this data at the, this point because we're only talking about small numbers of patients, 30 in community and 30 in hospital um, cardiac arrests. But what is interesting is that we're starting to see it. We'll probably see more of it, whether that's a direct result of the COVID or whether these patients have other conditions that have caused them to have cardiac arrests and they've coincidentally had COVID infections. I don't know. And I think we need a lot more data before we can start to tease out some of the signals in that. Just to reiterate the numbers that I said at the start of the um, talk, in terms of intensive care, we've had about 1,500 deaths and roughly 1,500 people are being discharged alive. So it seems to be still a 50-50, roughly. But what I wanted to draw your attention to is this curve. And I think the useful one is the um, group of patients with um, outstanding data but in ICU. And what I'd like to, what I, what's interesting is you can see that they seem to be plateauing. Now, obviously, we're very early t days yet, and as such, we're going to need to see more data to really know whether this is just a statistical anomaly or whether this is actually a true trend. However, this is encouraging, and it does tend to suggest that the social distancing policies um, that were instigated about three weeks ago in the UK are starting to work. And certainly, looking at other countries that instigated it far earlier, um, because partly because their pandemics, their, their infections within the population started earlier, do show that there was plateauing and then a drop-off, and China is probably the most stark example of that. So maybe these policies are starting to work. There is potentially some light at the end of this first wave, um, and maybe it'll give us a bit of time to catch up to learn what we need to learn about how to manage these patients and then to take it forward when there's going to be an inevitable second, third or potentially fourth spike as we start to release some of the stringent social distancing policies that have been instigated so far. This table is just summarising the outcome data um, and I think it's pretty similar to what we've seen in the previous um, few reports. Overall death rate seems to be about 50%, a live 50% death. What I think is really interesting is the stay in critical care in days. And you can see here that survivors are spending about five days in hospital, and there's a range of between two and nine days, and non-survivors about six days, ranging from four to ten. That's not that dissimilar to what was seen last week. And so as we get more data, as more patients are staying for longer, we're getting a better idea. I think it's still too early to really give a good answer as to how long these patients are expected to stay in intensive care. But I think what is patently obvious at this point is that these are not patients who are going to very quickly turn around and leave intensive care. These are patients that are going to spend at least a couple of weeks in intensive care. So if you keep having new cases coming into intensive care, they're just going to build up more and more and cumulatively you're going to get a big increase. And even once we've got into the downward trend into the numbers of new cases that are occurring, we've got to remember that there's going to be probably looking at this data at least one to two weeks lag before the strain on the critical care units starts to ease up.
there's a lot of patients requiring um, support. The thing that I really wanted to highlight is this here, which is the renal support. About a fifth of patients are requiring renal support. And this number has been slowly going up as we're getting more experience and data on those patients requiring renal replacement therapy. This is quite interesting because when this pandemic first started, the early data from the China and also Italy were that these patients were primarily single organ failure, they were primarily uh, respiratory failure. What we're starting to see is that as much as 20% of patients are now requiring some degree of renal replacement therapy. And you'll see later in this talk, those who do have renal replacement therapy have other organ support as well. This is important because what this suggests is that these, again, these patients are going to be high intensity care patients. They're going to require a lot of equipment, a lot of nursing care, a lot of doctor care, and they're going to take a long time to get off the intensive care and may well have prolonged long-term healthcare complications from having these supportive therapies. Interestingly, if we look at the duration of organ support, I think again this is quite interesting. We'll break this down in a bit more detail, but it's about a week on it, uh, being intubated and ventilated, whether they die or survive. And they're requiring advanced cardiovascular support for a period of time as well. And interestingly, about four days of renal support. And that can range from three days up to a week. All of this data is fairly similar to what we were seeing with non-COVID -viral, non viral pneumonias previously. And as we all know, these patients don't just bounce back. What's interesting, however, is that even though these are all relatively similar, you can see here that the survival from a non-COVID viral pneumonia is so much better. 78% of these patients with non-COVID viral pneumonias surviving critical care versus only 50% of COVID patients. So it's humbling and it does show that this is a very severe disease and not one that's going to be a quick turnaround. I'm not going to go into too much detail about this, but you'll see in some of the tables, some of the tables I've already presented, we talk about advanced respiratory support and basic ventilatory support, advanced and basic cardiovascular support, and so on. Um, this is what we mean by all of those things. I'm not going to go through this. If you want to pause the video and have a good look at this, please feel free. I would, however, suggest just to highlight basic respiratory support. They include mask or hood, BiPAP and CPAP in that. So some may argue that that we'd consider as an advanced ventilatory support mechanism, but for ICNOC, they define it as a basic respiratory support. This is just a graphical representation suggesting that the vast majority of patients are requiring some degree of respiratory and cardiovascular support and up to 20% of patients are requiring some form of renal support. Now what's really interesting, and I didn't go through this in previous videos, but I think it's now that we're starting to get more data, it's more useful to have a look at this. It's starting to give us a flavour of these patients. This is looking at the patient characteristics, looking at indicators of acute severity, and this is acute severity of disease, and this is not COVID specific. And these are patients that are divided into those that require advanced ventilatory support and only basic respiratory support. And I re-emphasize that basic respiratory support includes CPAP. Of those patients requiring advanced ventilatory support, about 85% of them, 1,441 of them, required um, ventilation within the first 24 hours. And that's 1,441 required um, invasive ventilation as opposed to 821 that didn't. And that's in the first 24 hours. So the vast majority of those patients that were intubated and ventilated were done so right at the start of their disease uh, on admission to intensive care.
the Apache schools, and I'll go through what the Apache school is a little later, were much worse for patients with COVID who had advanced ventilator support compared to basic ventilator support. Again, that sort of makes sense. The interesting thing is they both fall into roughly the same bracket in terms of mortality. What's really interesting is looking at the PF ratios. Uh, I'll, the next slide will talk a little bit about PF ratios, but essentially you can divide patients into severe ARDS, mo moderate ARDS, and mild ARDS. The higher the PF ratio, the better the lung function, essentially. And what you can see here, and the thing that really surprises me, is if you look at those patients that require just basic respiratory support, 30% of those patients actually had severe ARDS and were not intubated. And as an intensivist, I find that really interesting. And it tends to suggest that maybe we, we, are, we may not need to intubate as many patients as we are, based purely on the blood gases and PF ratios. Now, obviously this doesn't correlate to outcome, and so we need a lot more in-depth analysis of this data. However, it does look interesting. But you can see here that the vast majority of patients are between moderate and severe ARDS, which is again clinically what we're seeing. So you might ask, what's the point in um, giving an, uh, the PF ratio? Well, the PF ratio has um, been around for a long, long time. But in the Berlin definition, looking at ARDS, what they did was they divided ARDS into mild, moderate and severe, and they used the PF ratio to do that. And the reason they did it was because the PF ratio does seem to confer a link with mortality. So mild tends to have a mortality of 27%, severe 45%. The first thing to say is even mild ARDS, which on the face of it sounds like it's not that bad a thing, more than a quarter of patients die. And with severe, almost half of patients die. Now that sounds like very high levels, but then if you look at the mortality data from COVID for intubated ventilator patients, we're talking about almost 65% of patients dying. So even though we use this, it seems to underplay the severity of the disease in COVID-19 and its uh, mortality rate seems to be a lot higher than what just a pure PF ratio would show. It's also worth emphasizing the fact that the PF ratios in the Berlin definition talked about doing it at a P per 5. Now I don't know how the ICNOC data is being analysed but certainly a lot of patients immediately on intubation for ventilatory failure were being put on 8, 10, 15 or even more of PEEP and so the reported results may actually be for higher PEEPs than what this mortality data was initially given with. And so these patients may well have even more severe disease than what on the face of it it looks like from the blood gases and the FiO2s reported to ICNARC. The Apache score is a very, in some ways, simple score. All it's looking at is um, scoring the level of physiological derangement from the normal. And it looks at a whole range of different variables and it scores them. So the higher the score, the worse the um, potential outcome for patients. And again, it's linked to mortality. An Apache score of 0 to 4 has only got a 4% death rate. And over 34, 85% of patients will die. Now, if you remember from the um, tables previously, you will see that the vast majority of patients who required basic or um, ventilatory support were around 13 Apache score and those that required advanced ventilatory support around 15. So you can see that again the purely looking at the Apache score you're expecting a 
death rate of between 15 and 25 percent. Whereas if you take just all comers into intensive care, we're talking about a 50 percent death rate. So again, the Apache school seems to be underplaying the mortality of these patients. The reason I emphasize this is I think that this might indicate that this these patients aren't necessarily getting multi-organ failure in the same sense as a critically unwell multi-organ failure patient in intensive care normally, and that it might just be a severe insult to the lungs or to the cardiovascular system that's enough to cause these patients to die without necessarily causing physiologic derangement in other areas. The honest answer again is I don't know, but what is useful to bear in mind is that both the Apache score and PF ratio seem to be underplaying the mortality that we're seeing in these patients. The same table can also be done for looking at patients who are requiring renal support. And the first thing to say is that around 20% of patients are requiring renal replacement therapy. As you're probably not surprised, these patients tend to have a much higher Apache score. Interestingly enough, we're seeing that those patients who are receiving um, renal support seem to be spread between the different groups, with the majority requiring it uh, being moderate to severe ARDS. And again, with those who are not requiring it, it seems relatively similar in terms of the percentages. So there might be something else going on here. And the honest truth is that we need way more numbers than 558 looking at the pathophysiology of what's happening in renal replacement therapy as well. Anecdotally, at least, we're seeing a lot of filters clotting off, a lot of prothrombotic states in these patients. And um, that certainly may be having problems with um, the patient's own physiology, stopping and starting um, filters, losing filter sets, and therefore having to top up with transfusions, which certainly increase mortality and may exacerbate um, AKIs. So lots and lots of confounders but an interesting signal. And looking at those patients who are requiring um, a renal support. So this group, so this row, this column is looking at those who didn't get any renal support and this, those who did. And you can see that the ages are fairly similar, that um, men and women, the distribution seems to be that of the um, prevalence of patients with who are male or female coming to intensive care with COVID. What is interesting is that about roughly 20% of um, patients who are women are requiring uh, renal replacement therapy and about 27% of those who are men. Now obviously we're talking about small numbers here so I don't know whether that actually as the numbers expand, will start to become equal, and it's roughly equal numbers of men to women who are getting renal replacement therapy as a ratio. But um, it seems that being male or female may not confer that much of an increased risk of requiring multi-organ support with renal, th uh, renal support specifically. Now, again, looking at those who require renal support, the key thing that I want you to have a look at here is the length of stay that these patients had before coming in to um, critical care. So this is the time that they were admitted into hospital to the point that they were admitted to critical care. Those that didn't receive renal support versus that did are pretty similar. And so this notion that maybe they're requiring renal support because they're waiting too long before bringing them to intensive care and optimising their fluid management, I don't think quite holds up at this point. 
I, I think this is probably one of the most useful graphs to show because you will hear the headline figures of 50% of patients dying and 50% of patients surviving uh, critical care. But I think the devil is in the detail. Looking first of all at those patients that do not require invasive ventilation within the first 24 hours, you can see that almost 70% of patients are surviving the um, critical care at 30 days if they do not receive um, mechanical ventilation within the first 24 hours. So I think this we take great heart in that, in the fact that if we can manage patients, not require them to develop um, severe enough respiratory failure requiring intubation and ventilation, we may well be able to prevent a lot of deaths. Now, the question is whether the intubation and ventilation itself is driving people to have an increased mortality or whether you're intubating and ventilating these patients because they're just that much sicker and so they are almost bound to be more likely to die. And until we get far more data, we're not going to be able to answer that. But what is humbling is to look at the um, patients who are requiring um, mechanical ventilation within the first 24 hours. The solid line here is those patients who are um, dying. And you can see here that almost 65% of patients are dying with if they were intubated within the first 24 hours. And only about 35% of patients are surviving at 30, at 30 days. So intubation within the first 24 hours really does look like a bad sign for these patients. But again, to take half from the fact that when the initial um, reports came out, we were talking about 70 plus percent of patients dying. And now as the numbers start to get larger, we're getting a bit more statistical accuracy. Um, we're starting to see that it's closer to the 65. And as we get more numbers of patients, we'll be able to more accurately understand what the mortality of this condition is, depending upon whether they get ventilatory support or not. This is an interesting slide, again, to re-emphasize the fact that we are in this for the long haul. If you compare length of stay for survivors and non-survivors in intensive care for COVID, you can see here that it's about five days is the medium, but look at the interquartile range between two and nine days or four and ten days for non-survivors. So the thing to take away from this is that these patients are spending about two weeks in intensive care. These patients do not seem to be declaring themselves early. If they were only spending two or three days in intensive care, we would at least know early on whether they're going to survive or not. But it looks like these patients are going to require two weeks, maybe longer, to really know what's what's happening. Now, obviously, take that with a slight pinch of salt because day in, day out, you're going to see what the trajectory of recovery is, whether patients are just deteriorating over the course of those two weeks, whether they're staying the same or whether they're getting better and better and better. But on the face of it, this is going to be a long time that these patients are going to be in intensive care for if they um, receive mechanical ventilation or even if they don't. I think it's really interesting also to look at the number of calendar days that they're requiring the different types of support. And you can see here that advanced ventilatory support is about seven days as a median. So they're requiring about a week of intubation and ventilation. And interestingly for renal support as well, they're requiring four days, but the range there is between three and seven days. So we have to bear in mind that these patients may require a week of renal replacement therapy. So as the numbers of patients increase, we're going to need more filters, we're gonna need more circuits, we're gonna need more nurses that are trained to be able to manage these patients. And also we're going to need to think about the anticoagulation strategy of these patients because at least anecdotally I'm seeing a lot of these filters starting to clot. Whether that's because we've got less experienced people managing the filters, less experienced people putting in the VASCATs, I don't know. 
but certainly that does seem to be a problem and something we need to plan for from a workforce perspective and also from a consumables perspective. When looking at the outcome in terms of respiratory support, this really highlights what we were talking about. 67% of patients are dead if they require advanced ventilatory support within the first 24 hours, comparing that to almost 80% of patients being alive if they um, only require basic respiratory support. Again, taking about two weeks um, in intensive care and if they've got um, organ support in the form of renal support, it can be up to a week with um, uh, renal support if they've got if they're intubated and ventilated, but still requiring between two and four days of the interquartile range of renal support if they're just on basic ventilatory support, um, which can be anything and up to uh, CPAP and NIV. In terms of renal support, those patients that are started on renal support, you can see that 80% of these patients are dying. Admittedly, we're talking about small numbers. Rather worryingly, even those patients who aren't receiving renal support, about 50%, 55% of them are surviving and about 40% are dying. But certainly, if they're put on renal replacement therapy, that confers a bad outcome potentially for these patients. So thinking about how we can prevent this, how we can optimise intravascular volume, optimise flow within the kidneys, and potentially trying to work out what the mechanism behind the kidney injury is, whether it's hypoxia driven, whether it's cytotoxic, whether it's vasculitic, or whether it's microthrombotic. And the honest truth is we just do not know enough about the pathophysiology of this disease to give an answer and therefore be able to target a treatment to manage that. But managing AKI, as always in intensive care, vital and will certainly reduce morbidity and mortality in the long term if we do it right. I really want to highlight in this the ages and the num and the percentage of patients who died in critical care. There is a perception, especially among younger people, that if they develop COVID, they'll just bounce back. But if you look at the patients between four, uh, 16 and 40, almost a quarter, 22% of patients died in critical care. So yes, if you are young, you're much less likely to develop critical, critically unwell COVID disease. However, if you do develop it, you're between a quarter and a fifth chance of dying in intensive care. One in five chance of dying in intensive care. So even though you're at slightly lower risk of actually getting to intensive care, if you do get there, these patients do die. And so young people, as much as the older generation, need to be very careful about their exposure to this virus. Once um, in intensive care, men and women seem to have relatively similar um, rates of death, men slightly higher. And so I think, again, just because men are at higher risk of coming to intensive care, once in intensive care, I think the risks start to balance themselves out and getting relatively equal numbers of each. In terms of BMI, the middle BMIs tend to um, do just as well with death and being discharged. So I don't at least from this data, I don't think BMI has a great part to play in the mortality of critically ill patients. But again, we've got too far, too few numbers really to give a good answer to that. I think what's really interesting here is the number of patients who um, require assistance with daily living. And those patients who did require assistance with daily living, 62% of them died in intensive care. 
So having that clinical frailty index at the start and having a clear conversation with family is useful. And I think this is a useful number to have in your mind. And you compare that to viral pneumonia, where only 30% of patients died if they needed assistance with daily activities of living. So we are talking about different people. So if people turn around to you and say, look, they survived intensive care before, they'll do it again. We are talking about different pathophysiologies here. COVID seems to be a nasty beast that has multi-organ effects. And if you do get a severe disease with it, it seems to very rapidly deteriorate patients. So I think in summary, a few learning points from this latest ICNARC data. Young people do get it, and you're between a fifth and a quarter risk of dying if you're admitted to intensive care. So young people truly do need to take this very seriously. Looking at the length of stay and the length of organ support, we are in this for the long haul. These are not patients who are going to bounce back within a couple of days. Of course, some might, but a lot of these patients are going to take a long time to come out of intensive care. So our capacity needs to be there, not just for the initial admission of these patients, but for the ongoing rehabilitation, management of organ support, and of course, the inevitable iatrogenic complications of being in intensive care, like ventilator-associated pneumonias, pressure sores, infections, and so on. Intubation confers a bad outcome. Now, who knows whether it's the actual act of intubating the patient, the actual act of mechanically ventilating the patient, or whether they were just had more severe disease, which is why we've ended up having to intubate them in the first place. What this does beg the question, though, is whether we need to at some point think about using non-invasive methods of um, ventilation and respiratory support and things like high flow oxygen and CPAP hoods as used in Italy quite successfully should be adopted in the UK. Of course it is not as easy as just talking about the data here. We need to think about the wider policy issues and I would suggest you cannot have CPAP or um, high flow oxygen without appropriate personal protective equipment for the staff looking after them otherwise you're going to get huge numbers of doctors nurses physios pharmacists dietitians healthcare assistants and everyone else dying of this disease because we will expose people to very high viral loads the question of ethnicity whether it's relating to socioeconomics or whether it's a genetic predisposition again far more work needs to be done on that but there does seem to be a signal towards a higher morbidity with those patients who are black and of um, ethnic minority descent. And the really surprising thing, the thing that really struck me, which is different to what I was expecting reading the early literature from both China and Italy, this does seem to be affecting the kidneys. About a fifth of patients are requiring renal replacement therapy and therefore we need to both factor this in from a human resources perspective, from a logistic perspective, from an equipment perspective, but also thinking about the post-intensive care management of patients, as inevitably some of these acute kidney injury patients will end up with chronic kidney disease. I hope you found that useful. If you have, please like and subscribe to the channel. Um, Every week as the ICNARC data comes out, I'll analyse it in a similar video to this. So if you want to get notification of that, if you hit the bell notification button next to the subscribe button, it'll update you when the next video comes out. Thank you very much.